Hi, I'm Gerald O'Doherty with Renaissance Electronics. In this instructional video, I'll be guiding you through the process of developing graphical user interfaces, or GUIs, that will run on the Renaissance RX65N Envision Kit. We'll explore the code development tools to be used, get some pre-made sample GUIs running, and then create a brand new GUI from scratch. But first, let me tell you a little bit about the RX65N microcontroller and the Envision Kit. The RX65N Envision Kit has a 32-bit RX65N microcontroller that contains 2 megabytes of code flash memory and 640 kilobytes of on-chip SRAM. This advanced version of the RX65N also has an on-chip graphics LCD controller with a 2D drawing engine that greatly accelerates graphics operations. When you first try out the Envision Kit, it comes preloaded with a few demo applications. These show the performance benefits of the 2D drawing engine, as well as providing an example of a GUI on the 480 by 272 touch display. In this video, we'll be overriding the out-of-box firmware and replacing it with several new examples. If you want to restore the out-of-box application to your Envision Kit, you'll need to obtain the original firmware from the Envision Kit webpage. Before you begin developing your own new GUI, you'll need to download the MWIN libraries and tools from Segger. The Envision Kit webpage has a link that leads you there. This takes you to the RX65N microcontroller page where you'll find the link to MWIN by Segger. You'll arrive at Segger's MWIN page for the Renaissance RX65N. Users of the RX65N microcontroller are entitled to free use of the MWIN graphical library by Segger, including several Segger GUI development tools. I'll show you some of the basics. Scroll down to the link where you can register as a new user, or if you're already registered, go ahead and download the software package. When the download is completed, unzip the software package into the location of your choice and take a look at the folders it contains. The doc folder contains the API manual for MWIN. You're going to refer to this frequently during your development. The download package includes a sample E2 Studio project that duplicates some of the features of the original out-of-box demo. In addition to the sample E2 Studio project, the MWIN package includes files for several generic sample GUIs that can run on the PC-based MWIN simulator, or can be adapted to run on the Envision kit. The last folder in the download is the Tool folder. The tools in this folder you'll use most frequently are the BMP Convert, the Font Convert, and the GUI Builder tool. The MWIN RX65N folder, the E2 Studio project, includes all the demo source code. The MWIN libraries that run on the RX65N are also packaged in this sample project. It's a good idea to build this project as is and flash it into your Envision Kit to get a working baseline from which you can build on. I'll walk you through the process. Open up E2 Studio, import existing projects into Workspace, browse to the MWIN RX65N folder in the download package. Select that. Make sure and copy the project into the workspace. Taking a look at that, we can see that all the folders were brought in from the import process. Go ahead and build that now. In this project, the GUI folder is where you'll find all the interface files for the MWIN API. You'll also find the MWIN lib file there. You'll need to include this in any project that uses MWIN. The application folder is where you'll find the actual demo sample code.
Okay, let's go ahead and download this onto the Envision Kit with the debugger and give it a test run. Here's the familiar demo screen. Let's try the 2D Drawing Engine demo to see how the 2D Drawing Engine benefits the graphics performance. The frames per second is monitored and shown at the top of the screen. Turning off the 2D engine drops the frame rate from 65 down to 7. The motion is also much smoother when using the 2D engine. The 2D drawing engine is particularly effective in assisting with scrolling motions, moving windows around on the screen, and other typical block moves. It also helps with drawing primitives such as arcs, circles, polygons, rectangles, and the like. This demo also shows the effects of the RX-65N's floating point unit, which is used in calculating the moving positions of the bouncing balls. The performance benefit of the FPU is also quite evident in the Mandelbrot demo. All right. Let's move on to exploring some of the demo GUIs and GUI widget tutorial samples that come with MWIN. First, I'll bring my GUI base project into E2 Studio. One of the tasks needed before you can begin creating a new GUI is to get the board and display hardware running and ready for use. Using the sample demo project for reference, I created a base hardware project that starts the hardware up and jumps to an empty main function ready to accept my new application. When I create a new GUI application, I create a copy of my base project, preserving the original, and then do all my development work in the copy. My base project already has the MWIN library files and the LCD and touch controller drivers added and configured, so now I can focus on just developing the GUI application itself. It's a good idea to have something like this configured for your projects that you're going to be working on that lets you experiment without having to start from scratch every time. Let's try adding one of the Seger sample GUIs to the base project to see how it works. In the MWIN simulation sample application folder of the download package, there are several GUI samples that are nearly ready to use on the Envision Kit. Some of these are already scaled for the Envision Kit's 480 by 272 pixel display size, so let's start with one of those. Next, I'll copy and paste the whole weather forecast 480 by 272 folder into the source folder of my E2 Studio base project. Since this sample was written for the PC-based simulator, Opening the weather forecast 480 by 272 folder, I find that there are several files that I won't need, since they're only used by the simulator build. There's a 7z archive that contains bitmap resource files, and an lcdconf.c file that I won't use. So I'll just exclude or delete those from the new project. Instead, my project will use the lcdconf.c file that I've already included in my GUI base project. Now all I need to do is have my empty main function call the main task function found in maintask.c. Open the source file maintask.c. There you can find the declaration for main task. Most of the Seger sample GUIs start with a generic function called main task. This makes it easy to just swap in the different samples to give them a try without changing your application that calls them. Add an extern so the linker can find it. We won't need GUI init in this case because this sample project already calls that. Just grab a copy of that and paste it into the main function. From there, it's going to get called once, and after that, the main just sits in a while loop. Processing continues for the GUI through GUI events triggered by timer-based interrupts. So just go ahead and build that, download it using the debugger, and run. Let's take a look and see what we've got. 
This sample GUI gives an example of the layering of bitmaps over one another and of a nice horizontal scrolling feature that moves with a momentum effect. It's useful to study the source code for this sample together with the MWIN API manual to help in learning to apply these behaviors and effects. When layering bitmaps like this, you could take advantage of the alpha channel blending offered by the RX65N's LCD controller to implement transparency effects. Okay, let's try another one of the demos. There's another one called Swipe List Demo that also has the correct screen resolution, so let's try that one. I'll copy that into the same location where I placed the weather forecast demo in my E2 Studio base project. So let's just delete the weather forecast folder. Taking a look at this swipe list demo, we see that it also has lcdconf.c, so we'll delete that. Delete the resource 7z. And let's open up swipe list demo.c. This is where we're going to find, again, the main task function, just like we did in the previous demo. Nothing has changed here that we need to add to our main function. Main will call main task, just like it did in the last demo. So it looks like it's ready to just build. And we can download that in the debugger. and run it. The swipe list demo is divided into two panes. The pane on the left is a vertically scrolling section from which you can select text entries that can serve as buttons. In addition, there are a number of widgets that are used as dividers to highlight and separate sections of that list. The pane on the right half of the display is used as an information area that displays information about the list item that was selected on the left. Since this project was created for the PC-based simulator, it's not taking advantage of the RX65's 2D graphics engine, which would make the motion a lot smoother. That could be turned on with just a few more lines of code. Now that you've previewed some of the sample code resources, let's take a look at the MWIN GUI development tools which you will use when creating your own graphical user interface. First is GUI Builder. This is a Windows-based tool that lets you create dialogues by dragging and dropping widgets onto the screen. Each GUI Builder project file is responsible for creating one screen, or dialog. The GUI Builder project generates the source code for the screen and places the widgets that are visible on it. The user application will have to manipulate the widgets through MWIN API calls. The bitmap converter utility is used to convert common image file formats into the desired MWIN bitmap format. It generates C source file of the bitmap that will be embedded in the user's code. Font converter will convert any installed font on the host system into a bitmap font that's used on the target system. This will create MWIN font files either in binary or a C file format. The basic steps in using GUI Builder are first check the project path to make sure it's going to generate the source code in the location where you want it to. Start GUI Builder. Then start out with a frame win or window widget. Place child widgets within the parent window. Configure those widgets and save the dialog, which will generate the source code for that dialog at the location that you indicated in the project path. The name of the source file generated will be taken from the name of the parent widget in the dialog. The generated code contains a creation routine and areas where users can define their own code. These are delimited by comments that state user start and user end. For GUI Builder to be able to read back the code after user changes, you need to make sure that you keep your changes within these sections. The callback routine in the generated file is where the main activity takes place. There are typically two message handlers generated, wm init dialog, which is where the screen initialization takes place, 
and WM Notify Parent, which is where events that control the activity of the dialog are handled. When starting GUI Builder for the first time, the project path will need to be established. This is going to be set in a file called GUIbuilder.ini, located in the folder where GUIbuilder.exe is executed from. GUIbuilder.ini doesn't exist initially, but after the first time GUI Builder is executed, then GUI Builder.ini will be generated. After that, you can edit the contents of the .ini file to set it to the path for your project file. Now it's time to create a brand new GUI with E2 Studio and GUI Builder. I've created another copy of my E2 Studio GUI base project and renamed it RX65N GUI Keyboard. This is the location where I want GUI Builder to generate the code for the new dialog screen. Since I need to update the GUI Builder project path, I'll get the location from my E2 Studio source folder's property page. I'll just copy that. and paste it into the GUIbuilder.ini file. Now that's done, I can open up GUI Builder and start creating my new dialog screen. First, I'll add a window widget. Then I need to adjust the X and Y size to match the Envision Kit's LCD screen size, 480 by 272. This will serve as the parent widget and background of my main screen. I'm going to rename this to something unique that I can recognize within the code. Saving that will generate a C source file named terminalwindowdlg.c. When I open that file, We can see the callback dialog function and the create terminal window function that have been generated. Every GUI needs input and output, so I'll add some widgets to handle that. Let's add a button first. And I want to give the screen a nice background color, so I'll select that from the color palette. Now I'll fill in some of the properties of the button widget. First I'll give it a unique name that will serve as an identifier in the code. And I'm going to change the text. This is what actually appears on the button when it's shown. Next for output, I'll add a multi-edit widget. The multi-edit widget allows the display of larger sections of text it includes some nice automated features like vertical scrolling when the text exceeds the size of the displayable area. I can drag it to the size that I want it to appear. That looks about right. Let's save this now and see what it looks like in the code. Well, there are some identifiers for the new widgets and some of the properties are being initialized here. We can see our terminal window screen size there, the button one coordinates and dimensions, and the multi-edit coordinates and dimensions. A window create routine was generated to be called by the user application code. I'll go ahead and add a call to that to my main function now. I'll add a declaration to declare create terminal window as an extern. And add the create terminal window function call to my main function. 
I could go ahead and build this now, and if I ran it, we would see a screen on the Envision Kit that looks just like what we saw in GUI Builder. However, there wouldn't be any code to make it do anything. It would just sit there and look pretty. So let's go ahead and add some code to make the GUI fully interactive. Back in GUI Builder, I'll be adding more buttons to make a full alphanumeric keyboard, and I'll need to maximize the usage of my multi-edit window to leave room for all the buttons. So first I'll make some adjustments to its size and position. For more precision than I can get with the drag and drop, I'll edit the position and size in the Properties pane directly. I'll clear the Content property because I don't need it to have default text visible on Startup. And I'm going to change the font to something a little bit larger. Right-click on the widget name brings up the Additional Properties menu. Let's go with a 16-point font. Now I'll edit the button properties. I'm going to change the name to make it a little bit easier for typing. Set the X position and Y position. Let's go with 28 by 28 pixels for the button size. And I'll choose a 24 point font. Button one's done now, so I'll add another button. This will be button two. I'll leave a four pixel space between the buttons. Set the same size again. Set the button label to two and set the font size again. I've got about 40 buttons to set up so this is going to be a pretty repetitive process. I'll just create a bunch of buttons all at once and then edit them in turn. I'll go ahead and set all the names first. It'll be easier to keep track of which buttons which by doing that. That's enough buttons for my top row of keys, so I'll start setting the coordinates and moving them into place. We don't need to watch the entire process of creating all these buttons. It all goes pretty much the same with adjusting the X and Y locations for the buttons and the sizes and the fonts. Sometime later, and I've got all my keys finally laid out, I'll go ahead and save this to generate the code. Back in E2 Studio, the generated file has gotten a bit larger. Event handlers have been added for each of the buttons on my keyboard, but these are empty. I need to add code so they'll do something. You can see that for each button handler, there's a user start and user end area. This is where I add my own code that will determine what that button's going to do. I've decided that I want each keystroke to appear in the multi-edit window so that I can see what I've typed. So I'm just going to put in my own function call here as a stub. Since my base project uses fit modules, I'm going to include platform.h, which is going to include all of the standard C libraries. I'll add my function prototype in the user area at the top of the file. And add two parameters, one to represent the ASCII key code for the key that was pressed. And since GUI Builder gave me two event handlers for each key, I'll add a second parameter to account for whether it's the key pressed or key released event. Now I'll add the body of my key handler function at the bottom of the file in the user area there. Now that I've got a common routine for handling all of my keystrokes, I'm going to open the MWIN user manual to see what options I have for getting the contents of those keystrokes into my multi-edit window. I see that Emwin has a section on keyboard input. Let's take a look there and see what's available. The GUI store key message API function should do the job. I'll just grab a copy of that now and paste it into my key pressed function. This function has a set of parameters that mirror the ones that I added to my key pressed function. So I can 
pass the value of those arguments directly into the GUI store key message function call. MWIN manual tells me that the window manager pulls the keyboard buffer automatically and sends keyboard messages to the currently focused window. I want my keystrokes to go to the multi-edit window, so I need to make sure that it has the focus when a key is pressed. I need a handle variable that identifies the multi-edit widget. I see in the WM init dialog section that the multi-edit widget has been assigned a temporary handle. So I'm going to copy that method to create my own handle that I can be able to access later. I'll just grab a copy of that line of code, insert it into the user area at the end of this section, and assign it to my own new handle variable, which I'm going to declare in the global section. The temporary handle was of type WMHWIN, so I'll use that type and make it a static. Now that I have a handle for the multi-edit widget, I can start applying some of the API functions available for this widget type. I'll look up multi-edit in the user guide. I see that it's able to respond to a number of special keys that have been defined. So I'm going to use those later. Here it is, set auto scroll V. I want to use the vertical auto scroll feature. This will add a vertical scroll bar automatically once the text contents of the multi-edit window exceeds the size of the visible display area. I'll just grab a copy of that and place it into the user area of the wInit section so that this is taken care of during window initialization time. Copy in my new handle and set it to 1 to turn on the feature. I'll also set the focus here now to the multi-edit window just so that it gets the focus on initialization. I'm going to have to reset this again later though, as you'll see. I also want to set the multi-edit buffer size to make sure I have enough memory for the text that's going to get stuffed in there. In a real application, you'd want to calculate this value carefully. But for this demonstration, I'll just give it a value of, let's say, 1K bytes. Now in my key pressed function, I'm going to go ahead and make sure that I'm setting the focus back to the multi-edit widget each time a key is pressed. I'll make sure that my multi-win ID handle has been initialized first before I use it. This is why I created a separate function for my key pressed handler instead of calling the GUI store key message function directly. This makes sure whenever the key pressed event occurs, I go ahead and set the focus at that time to the multi-edit window. Now all that's left to do is to start filling in all of the ASCII key codes and the key pressed state for each of the button handlers. For each of the alphanumeric keys, I'll just add the character literal expression. MWIN has macros for several of the special keys, so I'm going to use those instead of trying to dig up the ASCII key code for those. This method should be more portable.
that should be it. I'll go ahead and build this code, download it to the Envision Kit, and we'll see how it looks. There you have it. As you've seen, creating an attractive GUI application with the RX65N is a bit of work, but can be done fairly quickly with the tools Renaissance makes available. The rest is up to your creativity and imagination. For more information on RX65N and the Envision Kit, visit the Envision Kit webpage at www.renaissance.com/envision. And thanks for watching.